Alright guys, so first things first, we're gonna, gonna kinda go over cells. Um, you can read this. I'm gonna write some of this out, but more importantly than anything, just kinda try to listen to the things that I say. And I'll bring your attention to, essentially, a well-rounded review of all the topics that we've covered, with at least the basics. So, um, there's an interesting hypothesis that talks about... You don't need to really see this, right? There's an interesting hypothesis that talks about how we got life on Earth, right? And essentially it's called the alien hypothesis. And the reason for that is that some scientists believe that life came from outer space. And that's because um, we've never been able to essentially generate spontaneous life using any experimentation. Now, essentially... We've done a few things. One one was called the Miller-Urey experiment, where we, we took some big bottles full of water and essentially filled them up with this primordial soup, some really basic carbon, hydrogen, right, water, and then essentially electrocuted it to try and simulate early Earth. And we've been able to spontaneously generate some really, really important molecules, things like RNA and so forth. But we've never been able to generate, essentially, um, the biggest indicator of living things. And, and that's... Those are cells, right? So we're going to talk about cells for a little bit, right? So the presence of cells. Presence of cells. You can have elements, you know, and a lot of planets just have elements, right? But, but they lack cells, so they really lack any proof of, of living or biotic life on that planet. So the presence of cells. And these cells have lots of unique abilities that we've talked about, right? And living things have the ability to do a lot of really unique things. Um, reproduce is one of them, right? Reproduce, make more cells, make more copies of themselves. They also have the ability to maintain internal conditions despite an external environment, things like maintain homeostasis, right? You have all of this stuff in your lecture guides. But they can respond to stimuli. Some of them can move around and so forth. Some don't move around at all. Right? Some plants just sit in one spot and make energy and so forth. Hopefully this is jogging some of your memory, right? But either way, the most unique thing we have, cells. So we can kind of draw cells, right? We have, and this is just my big ugly sloppy cell right here. Cells have a lot of unique attributes. Some of them are super simple, some of them are super complex, right? You can have things like prokaryotic cells. You know, I'll draw some prokaryotic cells over here. Prokaryotic cells. Are the simplest, right? Hopefully you guys remember these include things like bacteria. Right? We talked about E. coli in class as an example of this. And prokaryotic cells, they're named as such because they don't have a nucleus. They do have an area where you typically find their genetic information. It's called their nucleoid. It's one of the four basic required structures of a prokaryotic cell, nucleoid. And then we have this cell membrane. And then, of course, we have this jelly-like substance called cytoplasm on the inside where the chemical reactions occur. And then bacteria also have ribosomes so that they can make proteins that they need to survive. Now, most bacteria have more than just this, right? Most of them have a number of optional structures. Uh, things like a capsule, a capsule around the outside. And a capsule allows them, it's essentially this protective outer sheathing, but it also makes those bacteria extra sticky, which is exactly what you want to be if you're a bacterium, right? You have the ability to stick to stuff, people transfer you around, and because of that, you get to run around uh, finding resources to keep yourself alive as a bacteria. A lot of times this involves infecting people and so forth, but sometimes you're just part of the normal healthy flora like E. coli we have already inside of us. You get sick from it when you get either a particularly infectious form of E. coli or too much of it. Maybe you've been shopping at Trader Joe's. I don't know what's going on. Now there's a lot of other optional structures, right? Some bacteria have these things called pili. These little projections that stick out from the outside, right? These are pili. And pili serve a number of purposes. They also, like the capsule, help them stick to things. But more, more than that, they're involved in um, bacterial conjugation, which is essentially just bacteria sex, where they essentially transfer information from one bacteria to the next. 
Now, the question is, what kind of information are they transferring? Well, they transferred things that are really a pain in the butt for us, things like antibiotic resistance through these extra loops of DNA that we call plasmids. So most bacteria also have these things called plasmids. They carry a lot of information. Remember, we have on our genes, we carry information. Essentially, that makes proteins and on a plasmid, you may find a pro, uh, information to make a protein that could help you um, deal with an antibiotic. So you expose this bacteria to amoxicillin, and maybe it has this thing called an efflux pump. We'll talk much more about this later in the semester, where it sucks in the antibiotic and shoots it out the back. So when you take amoxicillin, it's not going to mess with that bacteria, right? So plasmids, antibiotic resistance transferred from bacteria to bacteria via these elective projections that we call pili. So a couple other optional bacteria structures. Some of them also have flagella, and you guys are familiar with the fact that those allow them to swim around more easily. And of course, some animal cells also have these. So do some plant cells. In fact, um, most sperm cells of plants and animals have flagella. They can be all different shapes and sizes. Now, some particularly infectious forms of bacteria also have this even additional hard outer coating that they can form sometimes called a spore. And spore-forming bacteria are particularly dangerous because of this. I mentioned now in class, spore-forming bacteria can just sit around on the surface of something for a really long time without actually harming or without actually being harmed so that they can self-preserve, preserve themselves for an extended period of time until they infect something. Um, if you're in the lab, then bacillus is one of the examples of the bacteria you'll be messing with that forms spores. So, really basic overall cell structure, right? Now, when you compare that to something like a eukaryotic cell, eukaryote, name means has a nucleus, pretty much the main difference is that eukaryotic cells have more specialized cellular structures, and we pretend like they're little itsy-bitsy organs, so we call them organelles, essentially. And eukaryotic cells have membrane-bound organelles, and they're more complex, so that's the main difference between them and their when comparing them to uh, bacterial cells in nature. So if we look at the overall structure of a eukaryotic cell, sure, there's an area that we typically find their genetic information, right? We have a nucleus. You guys know that inside of it we find that DNA, right? And probably something that you're not familiar with, at the very center of the nucleus is this thing called the nucleolus, and that's where we actually make ribosomes in eukaryotic cells. But most of the time we have this loose stringy DNA hanging out in the form of what we call chromatin, and then other times it's what's known as um, your chromosomes, and you guys are all pretty familiar with that. So we have our nucleus. Surrounding our nucleus, we usually have these folded proteins that we all together call the endomembrane system. And some of these projections project outward and are actually smooth and characteristic, and some of them project this direction, and they're actually covered in ribosomes. And of course, you probably know that the difference between these is that one's called rough because of these ribosomes, and the other one's called smooth. Now, the rough ER is responsible for making those glycoproteins that we use to label things. Think about that vesicle or that thing, that big bubble that transfers or moves things around inside of the eukaryotic cell. It has all these labels on it, tells the cell where to take things. Outside the cell, inside the cell, somewhere else in the cell. You get the idea. And then we have this smooth ER, right? And the smooth ER is responsible for a number of things. Detoxification, talked about in class, so rough. We could say glycoproteins. And then the smooth is responsible for detoxification. And remember, it makes those enzymes. It helps us break down and detoxify any foreign substances that shouldn't be inside of our body, which is why we find a great deal of smooth endoplasmic reticulum in cells that we find inside of our liver, right? Because our liver is responsible for detoxifying a lot of things um, that go or filter through our body. Now, the smooth ER also makes stuff, right? It also makes things. It makes things like cholesterol, which we actually talked about some in class today. And from cholesterol, it also converts some of that cholesterol to really important uh, hormones, things like testosterone and estrogen.
We call these sterols together, and they're just these lipid-based um, hormones that we use to regula regulate sexual maturity, sexual function, and so forth. And they're produced in the smooth ER. So the smooth ER has a number of really, really important functions, right? And now, there's a ton of other things that we can find throughout here. We can find, um, maybe we have a lysosome in here. You guys know lysosomes have those digestive enzymes. They're responsible for breaking down extra material. And we talked about really important characteristics of lysosomes is that they also break down uh, the overaccumulation or abundance of lipids in your cells. Uh, we talked about Tay-Sachs disease, right? Tay-Sachs is that genetic disease where we have that over-accumulation of lipids and the lysosomes attempt to try and bake them down, but sometimes, or always, essentially by a certain age, these lysosomes can no longer perform their function and they break open and leak their enzymes all over the inside of the cell, which of course, those digestive enzymes does a significant amount of damage, so that's why this is a fatal genetic disease that relates directly to one of your organelles. Now, there are also other things that you guys are well familiar with. Um, and you find things like your energy production organelles, things like your mitochondria, right? I'll just draw a picture of a mitochondria. Someone emailed me and asked me why mitochondria look like peanuts. I'm not really sure I know the answer to that one, right? But in any case, mitochondria is responsible for producing energy, right? Makes energy. Makes energy for everything, right? If you're going to, like, your ribosomes make proteins, right? But you need energy to do that. So, your energy, or the energy that you use to make proteins comes from your mitochondria. And we'll talk when we talk about great detail about cellular respiration, how we eat food and break it down and turn it into that energy-based molecule, ATP, how it fuels all of these functions, right? Essentially, ATP is this charged molecule that, that, that breaks apart and the movement of that particle, we use the kinetic energy from that to, to power pretty much everything, right? If... I don't know, if this happens to be an animal cell that has a long flagella because it's a sperm cell, the energy that we get to move around comes from the mitochondria. Every cell makes proteins. The energy we get comes from the mitochondria. Shucks, even if you're a plant, right? This thing does cellular respiration in plants too. Remember... Plants store up their extra energy as starch, and then they break it down. We go and eat that starch as humans, but plants just store it up inside of their body, and then essentially, if you can even call it a body, but plants store up that starch and then break it down to make energy for cellular respiration for things that they need to do too. So just hopefully you're getting the concept, right? Mitochondria not only perform cellular respiration in animal cells, but they provide the energy to do nearly every cellular process inside of your body and inside of your cells, right? So hopefully that makes sense. Now, these are just some of the basic structures that we talked about. You know, we have vesicles, we have a cytoskeleton, you know vesicles are those bubbles, we transport things around, kind of hard to draw a bunch of bubbles, draw, uh, moving around without really making this picture super obscure looking, right? Um, but also, we have a cytoskeleton in here, just another thing that would make that really complicated, right? 